everybody, I'm Dr. Boz. Welcome to the Dr. Boz Show. I am coming to you live from Oahu, North Shore here in Hawaii. And it might be one of the last times I come live from here for a while. So I thought I'd go pick some flowers and <laughs> we don't have anything close to this in South Dakota. So you can actually just walk out and walk down the street and these beautiful flowers are actually laying on the ground. It's amazing. Um, I am very excited to share with you a slide deck that I have, I actually have been collecting some of these pictures and some of these uh, uh, educational cartoons for a while trying to put together what's the best way to explain to people that there's more to the ketogenic diet and improving your health uh, and talking heart attack than just talking LDL cholesterol. So we're going to talk about keto and heart attacks today, but there are a few traditions we have here on the Dr. Boz channel. And one of them has to do with my poking my finger. So I'm going to put my uh, strips into my Foracare and check my numbers right here in front of you. And I do not know how they're going to be. I know that I have not been feeling well. Not, not feeling well, just like having a day that's heavier than some. So I, uh, I am checking my numbers. I think it has to do with being away from home now for 11 weeks. What are we at? I think my kids said it's 71 days we've been away <laughs> and I miss my church and I miss my home and I miss my bed, but I'm not complaining. <laughs> All right. So my blood, my blood sugar is 88 and my ketones are counting down to 1.1. So not terrible. Lots of Dr. Boz ratio somewhere around, what, 79 or something like that. And I will check them again at the end of the uh, show. But today I am going to tell you that I mixed up some ketones in a can. My son uh, <clears throat> unpacked his college dorm. And like a good mother, I had sent him ketones to say, you know, if you're looking for energy, sugar's not the best thing to drink. Um, he's my firstborn, so rule follower, and, um, but even despite that, he uh, had three canisters of the ketones in a can at the beginning of the school year, and he still has two left, so <laughs> he must have used it a little bit, but, but this is what I do. When I don't feel good, people say, isn't it cheating if you have ketones um, it, during your fast? And I keep saying, you're not going to say that when you have fasted for every week for, I don't know, what am I at, two years now or something? because sometimes it just is harder. And um, as this past week, I kind of put, put the final um, lecture together, or not together, but launched the lecture inside my course. And I delivered a bonus round for this first class of students, which might be my best thing I've ever put together. Um, and it is an hour long. It is only intended for people who have gone through the course and really just focused on their foundation of understanding for a ketogenic diet, a uh, ketogenic journey. And then I deliver fasting. And really, what's the hidden stories behind fasting? And um, I really loved researching it. I loved delivering it. And, and as I share it with people, um, in there we talk about what do you do during a fast? And, and in the true spirit of being, keeping it real, there are some good fasting, there's some better tricks for fasting, and then there's the perfect fast. And I don't need to be perfect. I need to keep trying. And when I don't feel good, and it's the beginning of when I usually start to fast, uh, I'm not afraid to say, okay, just help yourself by adding the kind of fuel that I know makes me feel better, that suppresses my appetite, that does improve uh, the long term. And it's not something I do every week, but when I do it, it's because I'm having a day like today, which is just not great. <laughs> so here's, here's to, this is not alcohol. It is ketones and I put a little bit of uh, cream in it. Oh, and I really like it. Put some ice in it. And I'm just really thankful because uh, it is, uh, the product is actually back on Amazon as of like this week. Uh, I think Friday was on and off. I think it'll officially, it's for sale again now. But I can't even buy it, right? So it's been until now, when I when we unpacked my son's dorm room, I'm like, oh my goodness, we have two bottles of ketones. This is great. Um, anyway, so thanks for everybody checking in. Just looking through the uh, comments here really quick before we get into the lesson. 
and saying that uh, everybody can hear and I just love seeing where everybody's from. And I must tell you, I really can't, uh, I could never have appreciated how, uh, how welcoming the community of, uh, of North Shore has been to us as we landed here. We did not mean to land here. And I will say it's, uh, it's like South Dakota, part of South Dakota moved to the North Shore. They're very welcoming and they're very uh, family orientated and have been great. Uh, however, there is a neighbor who's been working on his deck, and so I'm praying he does not turn on the skill saw during this live. <laughs> so if it starts to get really loud and I cut the lecture short, you'll know what happened. <laughs> anyway, so I do want to say thank you to all the people who uh, signed up for that course that I launched. It was just a five-day opening that I launched it to test it to see how well it was going to be received. Um, we did some extra special things like have lives at the end of each module and then, of course, have this uh, extra bonus lecture, which is all about the science of fasting built upon a ketogenic diet. Uh, and unlike just intermittent fasting and unlike just ketosis, the combination of why they're so important for healing the human body has been great to research. And I'm so thankful for the students that signed up and have helped me learn about um, what Where's the gap in my teaching? When you teach to an audience that isn't in front of you, you, you don't have body language, you don't have feedback, you don't have really questions because you, you can't guarantee that everybody's learned this. When you have questions on YouTube, I have you know some people who are just the first few days of a ketogenic diet and you really want to not scare them by talking advanced keto science, but you also uh, don't want to uh, not nourish the students that are ready for that advanced lesson. So. By doing this course online and really opening up uh, a module a week, recapping what they felt uh, the course was about, I, I learned a lot. Uh, I found that I, I think I'm on track for a pretty good message in my book, in my workbook. And I think the course is going to help a lot of people. We will be opening it up uh, again at some point. I don't know when that's going to be, but um, the point is I think, it, I think it was really well received. And I just want to say thanks for all of you that just saw five days of signing up and did it and joined me for the last few weeks. All right, so I am uh, going to also just do a quick announcement that um, as I've walked through several people uh, helping them learn how to fast or just learning the science of fasting in, this, in the class, I want to make an announcement and it will be in the show notes that I'm going to lead a community 72 hour fast on the 7th of June. So if you're interested in your first fast, my goal is 72 hours, but you do not have to fast that long. If you're looking to do your first 72 hour fast, you're welcome to do that. But in the same respects, if you're looking to do the first 36 hour fast, you're welcome to join us then. So there is a Facebook page where you can uh, sign up or you know click and follow along. Um, and Redmond Salt is actually the one who's hosting the event and uh, it just asked me to see if I would lead with, with uh, their, their team, and I said that would be a great, great idea. So um, looking forward to that, and if you haven't done fasting yet, please do not reach for a fast too soon. I have a lot of instructions on that, uh, that there are some people when they do step over that threshold for fasting and they shouldn't, um, it's not the right timing for them. Please, please, please uh, be keto adapted before you step into that first fast, especially if you're on blood pressure medicines or a uh, or diabetes medicines. Um, I'm, I'm a big proponent for, I can show you how to do this without hurting yourself and without it being awful, uh, but it does start with listening to your body and having the right timing for that first fast. So if you're in that place, I'm gonna do a 72 hour fast, or that's my goal, <laughs> and um, as you kind of put that on your roadmap for a possibility, you can join us. You, you can find that in the show. Actually, I think I can copy and paste it into the comments here somewhere, I think. Um, here we go, yeah. Oops. I, t I typed here we go, and then I forgot to push the return button for my when I started. Okay, well, you know, that's how that worked. Okay, so let me uh, begin by saying this, uh, this topic that I'm about to uh, go through is, again, meant for uh, the audiences to not know much about a heart attack. We're going to walk you through some of the things that I just wish I could capture and, like, 
pensively put into people's brains on, when they start to say, isn't keto going to increase your LDL cholesterol? Isn't increasing your fat going to give you a heart attack? And there's so much more to it that I hope, I hope that's what you see by the time I get done with these slides. So let me go to here and say, yes, keto and heart attacks is the topic. Um, when you look at keto and heart attacks, I'm a, a big fan of saying uh, if you if that's all the further you look, uh, then uh, you're you're going. There's a lot of blunted and left out information when you don't uh, dive a little deeper into the understanding of not just ketogenic diet but also heart attack risk. Uh, so let me begin by going here and pushing play and watching. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. Okay. So yes, here is keto and heart attack. So I, I tried to pick some images that really help me take you on a course of, of visualizing what happens during a heart attack. So I want you to notice this is the tunnel of a bunch of red blood cells. Uh, and if you see off in that upper corner, they're coming out of the blood vessel and they've kind of cut open this blood vessel to show you an impending heart attack right in front of you there. These red blood cells are supposed to have a big, you know, circle shaped um, tunnel to flow through and something's blocked their flow. I think most people, when you ask them about a heart attack, they, they think, yeah, there's a heart, there's a, a, an artery that blocked off. It, it blocked off with a bunch of fat. And when you look at this picture, they have correctly depicted that that is, that's fatty cholesterol, that's fatty tissue. Um, but if that's all the further you look, you are missing the major point of how we know and how do we know how to prevent heart attacks. So what I'd like you to kind of look at is if you can look at the wall lining, you can see some rips in that wall and you're going to see that further as we go along. So those are called cracks. Um, they are plaque ruptures, if you would. And that is the biggest point of danger. So <clears throat> this is uh, an example of just looking at that, that um, blood vessel cut in half. And um, none, of these, <laughs> none of these are normal. Uh, what, what this uh, progression of time is showing you is the study saying, we know that this doesn't happen overnight. That when people say, I've been on the, uh, the ketogenic diet for six weeks and then I had a heart attack, I'm like, that heart attack started long before, long before that uh, ketogenic uh, transformation. Um, and one of, the, one of the focuses I've had in this uh, pandemic, looking at what, what can we use to predict who's going to have the highest risks for ending up on a ventilator, for having that cytokine storm from uh, COVID-19. Uh, and they have a lot to do with these uh, goofy letters down there uh, right above that arrow, that IL-1, interleukin-1, that TNF-alpha, uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-6, interleukin-18. And these don't matter much uh, to the world at large, but this is a huge uh, communication highway between pheromones or hormones that travel between two uh, uh, cells. And it is a predictor that says there is danger in this story. So looking at that foam cell, if you peeked down the tunnel of somebody with a foam, you know, you can't even see them in this picture. Uh, the fatty streak is the second chunk of that uh, blood vessel that's kind of sectioned off. And again, both of those are times where a primary a cytokine or, or chemokine or primary messenger inflammatory cytokines are flowing. And when you look at the chemistry behind what's happening, your eyeballs couldn't see that. A cardiologist can't put a camera in your artery and say, hey, I, I, I can see it. They can't see it. Uh, it is the cellular communication between cells that they're missing. When you look at the growth of this as it goes for, into a fatty streak, and then they call it an intermediate lesion and an atheroma, and then we get to something called a, a fibrous plaque. And finally, the one way over on the end is the complicated lesion or a rupture. And if you look at that yellow mound of fat, that's much like that image from the last slide where there's a tear down the wall of that blood vessel. And I contend that if you uh, start having heart, uh, heart symptoms during that fibrous plaque or the complicated lesion, uh, this is where a cardiologist is going to try to step in and fix a problem that's been brewing for the better part of a decade. 
and your, uh, your ask of that cardiologist to fix a problem that is so ingrained in between the cells of our body is ludicrous. Uh, they'll go in and they can offer you a stent and they can, you know, rewrite, you know, give you a new route of a, a, a you know, a bypass, you know, re-hosing up the, the blood flow so that the heart can still have good blood flow delivered. But I contend the reason those are just a thumb in the dike uh, for uh, saying we have got a massive wave of problem brewing, that's when you focus on these things that were also highly talked about in my lecture, uh, reviewing reviewing what happens with COVID-19. You know, that infection is in part related to the storm of cytokines that's brewing, that's, that people are getting ready for. And as you look at a low inflammatory state, that is the reason a ketogenic diet is uh, recommended by me, by looking at uh, people who say, how can we predict those who have a, uh, the highest risk for heart attacks? And that is, how can we predict inflammation? So this is another cartoon using very similar um, progression, but I think it does a, does a few things that the last two pictures don't do very well. So you can remember that fatty streak is that first chunk, uh, that first uh, section, and again, barely could you see that if you were a cardiologist. But what I, I want you to notice is that the red blood cells, those are those, they look like O's with a pink uh, uh, dot in the middle, they're supposed to be red blood cells, um, they're floating along that tube delivering oxygen to your body and then you can see way up at the top that one is really squished or it's squeezed down. That's dangerous. Um, your blood vessels are, your blood, uh, red blood cells are supposed to be able to flex and, and, and squeeze through little bitty arteries, um, but I contend if you have a high level of trans fats in your uh, in your diet and especially in your red blood cells, they get sticky, they do not flex into these tiny little spaces and they make it even easier for your body to have a heart attack. Uh, so going back to that fatty streak, I want you to notice those little orange, uh, they kind of look like mounds of something, but they're supposed to be um, smooth muscle cells and that red dot in the middle of that orange mound is supposed to be the nucleus. But those are our smooth muscle cells that that's probably what most of our arteries look like. Um, again, this is the wall that you're looking at on the outside. But as you progress to that atheroma, look at how many more of those uh, little bitty orange <laughs> globs with the red dots on them. Those are smooth muscle cells. So look how many more are there. Yes, yes, yes. If you look at those yellow dots in the blood, that is LDL cholesterol, that is lipids, uh, and you're right. If you're on a ketogenic diet, that increases. When you eat more fat, you do circulate more fat. And unfortunately, when I put a needle in your vein and I draw your cholesterol, I am not looking at the part where those smooth muscle cells are. I'm looking only at what's flowing through the tube. So when you eat a high fat diet, the amount of fat that I can see in your blood sample is going to rise. But I contend there is way more to the story than just looking at how many particles of LDL cholesterol were in the sample that I, I took out of your vein and ran through, the, ran through the lab. So again, looking at that atheroma, you've got some, some increased thickening. You can see you've got some of that plaque now under the skin of your, of your blood vessel. You go to the next one of uh, the atheromatous plaque, and now you've got some, you've got a, a little bit of crunch in how the the red blood cells can sneak by that that uh, that uh, restriction of the where the blood is flowing. Uh, what you'll also notice, though, is you see those red lines coming up from the bottom, and if you look over at the legend, that's supposed to mean um, angiogenesis, which means there's brand new red blood cells trying to make sure that this this infusion of fat, this infusion of foam cells, this plaque has, has a blood supply. And that's super strange. This is a, remember back to that first picture where this mound of fat has built up into the walls. And what your body is doing is now making sure that you have a blood supply delivering energy to that dangerous warning of a heart attack. Let's focus now in on the last square, which is, again, that rupture. The place in the wall that I showed you at the beginning that had the rip into it. 
you'll see that there's lots of, uh, of those orange uh, mounds with the red dots and lots of smooth muscle cells. The macrophages, which are kind of those blue ghost-like looking uh, cartoons, they are, the, they are the cells that they deliver the cytokines. When you had COVID-19 lecture about, uh, what is it, 10 weeks ago now I did that one, uh, that power of t showing up with a macrophage and delivering um, uh, the cytokines, but also gobbling up the things that don't belong. So when a macrophage gobbles up the LDL cholesterol, it's called a foam cell. And these foam cells are very predictive of, we can see this is dangerous. We can see that the body should not have this much plaque building up in the side of this uh, blood vessel. And the body is trying to empty it. Um, what I think is also interesting is those green uh, sections uh, with the blue nucleus is apoptosis, which I've used that word a few times. It is a cell that's dying. Uh, in part, it's dying because there's not enough nutrients uh, delivered by those little arteries stringing up from the bottom, uh, and the center part of it gets, gets putrid, gets rotten, if you will. It's necrotic. There's not enough blood supply and oxygen to keep those cells alive, and they die. And that, that is a soft, very fragile uh, uh, place that is incredibly risky for a heart attack. The final thing that I want you to notice is look at how restricted that, that, in order for that red blood cell to get from one side of that restriction to the other, it really has to squeeze into the, um, it, past uh, those, uh, those restrictions. And if you want the healthiest and most flexible of red blood cells, uh, you need to have a high number of omega-3 and omega-6 in the red blood cell lining, and you need to have a low number of those trans fats. That might sound like garbage to, all, to many of you, but if you have watched that, the lecture I had done on uh, your omega-3 index, you can measure what are your red blood cells made of. And do you have a high level of these flexible fats? And do you have a low level of the trans fats, which makes your red blood cells very stiff and very sticky? All right, so this is just another picture that did a little better job of showing what I was trying to uh, represent. Again, the lumen is the pink area there inside the red blood cell. This is, again, a straight cross section. That's where the red blood cells are supposed to travel through. That's supposed to be this you know, circular lumen, but a plaque has been growing. It's been around long enough that it has a blood vessel supply that is coming in and invading to make sure that these cells inside the, the the plaque have enough oxygen. And when they don't, they start to die. There are calcifications that show up in this plaque. And, and this is in part what uh, leads to, uh, what, what is your calcium score when you do a coronary artery calcium scan? I've said in the past, this is a great way to screen someone for where, has your, where have your arteries been in the past. So if you want to know, you know, doc, I haven't really taken care of things for a while. I, I wonder if I have a risk of a heart attack. I look at the $50 out of pocket. Even if you don't have insurance, it costs you about $50 uh, to get a coronary artery calcium screen. And what that does is it measures the number of these little calcifications that you can see in the yellow area uh, inside the coronary arteries. And it is a very interesting and insightful m measurement to say if we see zero, you can say, well, whatever you've been doing, it, your body has been keeping up and keeping the calcifications out of your plaques, uh, if you have plaques. Uh, your coronary arteries are at a low risk for a heart attack if there was no calcium in them. But the longer this plaque has been there, the more calcified you'll find uh, that, um, that score. And a coronary artery calcium score of 500, I've had a few folks over 1,000, uh, we love it less than, we love it zero. But if you have it under 100, you're in a pretty good spot for a low risk of a heart attack. And of course, if you do nothing and continue to grow calcium in your coronary arteries, we can watch that calcium score go up. What we don't know is once calcium has landed in those coronary arteries, how quickly or what are the right rules to get the calcium to go away? And I would contend keep your insulin low is going to be one of the answers, but I think there's a lot more to it. All right, again, I've collected these pictures trying to show the same picture from a few different angles because I just think it's so important. If you could think about what I think about when people say, I had my cholesterol checked and the LDL cholesterol is above 200, 
I'm gonna die. I'm like, no, <laughs> there's so much more to measuring LDL cholesterol. Uh, what, what you look at here is the, the one image is a normal artery. And again, look at those smooth muscles on the outside. They are all tucked neatly around the outside of the tunnel. And there are none that fade into the, what I would call the, the central lumen layer, or the, it's called the endothelium, which means it's like the skin on the inside of the tunnel. So if you were a red blood cell floating down this artery, the skin that you would touch as you floated down the artery is called your endothelium. And there shouldn't be any smooth muscle touching the endothelium. There is a layer between that that should separate these two. But if you look at the damaged or the uh, artery that's got narrowing and has a plaque, you now see that those smooth muscle cells have migrated up into their space. They're touching the endothelium. And this creates a cap to try and keep that, the cholesterol and the macrophages and those foam cells and the calcium and the debris all tucked in, not erupting into the uh, blood flow. Uh, but if there's a tear, it's right at the top of that fibrous cap. As, as I've looked in uh, to you know, many uh, just pathology reports at autopsy, you'll find that these fibrous, or that these plaques, they, there wasn't just one or two of them, and they're not just in your coronary arteries. Coronary arteries is a place we look because you're, the heart, heart attacks are, you know, that's one place of death. But when people say, oh, I got that plaque taken care of, or I got that, I had one, I had one part of my artery in my heart that had a narrowing, and, and you know, the doc put a stent in it, so I'm fine. No, 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 these narrowings are throughout all of the tunnels of your body. The arteries in your coronary arteries have an intense and, and very uh, um, center stage attention because of the life expectancy. But to think that there was one part of your, your body that had a, a, a narrowing and that's going to be corrected by a stent or by a bypass uh, um, from a, a surgeon uh, is foolish. That's not how this works. These are happening throughout the human body. And what we want is a system, a chemistry set that doesn't allow this to continue and that might reverse it even at pretty advanced stages. So when you look, as we start to take one of the uh, pictures on the left, this would be a vulnerable plaque. Uh, it's got a really juicy amount of fat in it that, that um, you can see the fibrous cap is very thin. And if you get a, a, a tiny little tear in that, you're gonna see that fat come billowing out into the place where those red blood cells are. And that's when blood flow stops. But if you look at the other one, there is some, there's a healing process that's going on. As much as I was crabbing about those uh, smooth muscle cells getting up and touching your endothelium, what happens if you can slow down this progression, if you can reabsorb that uh, lipid core, if you can undo those cytokines, you can get that fibrous cap to get thicker and thicker and thicker. And even though that lipid core might turn into calcium, there's quite a protection, there's quite a layer between that lipid core and the central part of that blood vessel where the red blood cells flow down. So this is the part that even when people come in and they have a significant risk of a heart attack, it's in our, in our minds, in the minds of physicians trying to say, how can we prevent this? We're trying to get your, you know, back away from the edge, back away from the edge. And that means that that, that cap needs to increase but it means we need to decrease the swelling and the cytokines and the inflammation markers flowing throughout your body. All right, so that brings us back to this picture again. So this time I hope you take a little careful notice that as these red blood cells are flowing down our tunnel, it gets really narrow. So you wanna have very flexible red blood cells that can squeeze through that. You'll notice that on, you know, the plaque really isn't just on one side, it's, it's winding around that part of the uh, the tunnel. So as much as almost all the images are drawn with only one side of a blood vessel filling up with a plaque, it's usually circumferential. It goes all the way around the tube. And then you'll notice that those little tears in, on the skin layers on the walls that the red blood cells are touching, in the places where there's a rip, that, that means that that fatty uh, plaque is now touching the red blood cells and that is a heart attack. That is a heart attack. That is a heart attack. Especially, I mean, if this is a coronary artery. 
So when I look at other places, if this is a, an artery in your leg, that is a severe muscle cramp. Often they can see that muscle uh, atrophy or grow very weak and small after the heart or after the attack. It's not a heart attack, it'd be a leg attack. Um, but I've had people with erectile dysfunction wonder why they can't seem to, you know, correct that problem when the blood supply in the arteries that headed to their genitals were affected by cytokines and, and by the blood flow and by plaques. So when we watch a tightening of coronary arteries, um, I, I just don't want you only thinking of coronary arteries. This is your brain. This is your, your body in general. This is your eyes. This is your uh, intestines. Uh, these arteries are going everywhere. And when, wherever that plaque erupts, if it's a heart attack, you're right. We know the symptoms and you're going to get amazing care in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the world of America at least. Uh, to get a stent placed and to get a cardiac uh, attention team focused on you. But there are arteries all throughout your body that nobody else is really assigned to, except maybe you and me. <laughs> all right, so now we're going to move on to what does that have to do with the keto diet? I'm going to take just a second to have a drink here. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is a picture of me trying to draw a triglyceride. So yes, you'll remember that those little rhomboids, those square fellas are supposed to be glucose. And it is a glucose molecule, a few glucose molecules that hold together the backbone of these strings of fat. So usually the three strings, uh, the triglycerides are <clears throat> certain lengths. We have small triglycerides, medium triglycerides, long triglycerides. But in general, this is what fat looks like in our body. And it is a very good thing. Triglycerides deliver energy to cells. They help repair your cells. Uh, your body's ability to absorb and use these energy units called fat um, really do matter. And when you increase your fat intake on a ketogenic diet, these little turkeys for a time are going to increase in your blood supply. And we're gonna show you what that looks like here in just a second. So this is the overview of what I'm about to go through, which is what does cholesterol cycling look like when the insulin is high? Okay, insulin again is the message saying store glucose, store glucose. We have too much glucose around. Everybody store glucose. The glucose has to be taken care of. And insulin is the ultimate dictator when it comes to uh, our human body. So in this picture, I want you to notice that liver See those little, three little lines inside the liver all over the place? That's a whole bunch of triglycerides that are stored in your liver. And then those white circles with the little glucoses in them, that's a representation of glycogen or stored sugar. Your blood sugar got high. Your body said, hey, let's put that, and put that into storage for later. And those glycogen storage units become a string that, that you wind up and push into your liver. Uh, your liver also stores fat, and the name of that fat is a triglyceride inside that liver. If you've been told you have a fatty liver, this is what your liver looks like. It doesn't just have excess fat in it. It has excess fat and excess glucose in it. So as we watch the uh, packaging of cholesterol, uh, oh, I did, nah, that's a much better picture of it. So now you have glucose. You can see that up close a little better there. The triglycerides are the the red bars with the three strings and the, um, the, the, bu the glycogen bubbles is what I call them, or the strings of glucose packaged away for when your body needs quick and uh, responsive uh, glucose to be released. All right, so the first thing that happens when your body is trying to, to deliver fat to the system is it packages the triglycerides and, and fats into uh, what's called a chylomicron. A chylomicron is, you can see on the inside that chylomicron, it's got that ApoB48 string on the outside, um, but it is filled with those little red dots, which are a whole bunch of triglycerides. As the chylomicron travels around, it dishes out triglycerides to anybody who's hungry, who needs fat molecules. And in the setting of high insulin, it's really hard to get that delivery process done because insulin wants you to use glucose before you use that fat. Um, as the chylomicron finally gets some of those triglycerides dumped off, we change that 
uh, particle. Uh, it actually stops back at the liver. It t rips off the ApoB48. It puts on an ApoB100. And now we, we call it a VLDL, so a very large, dense lipoprotein. <laughs> um, and then we uh, give out some more triglycerides. You can see those are exiting on all these little particles. And then it changes size a little bit. We call it an intermediate. Um, intermediately dense lipoprotein, and then it gives off even more triglycerides, and now it's called a low-density um, lipoprotein. And really what's happened is you, the amount of triglycerides in the chylomicron was the most, and then you got rid of some and we called it a VLDL, and then we got rid of more and we called it an IDL, and we got rid of more and we called it an LDL. And now what's supposed to happen is that LDL is supposed to go back to the liver and recycle, pick up some more triglycerides, and then we strip off the APO100, we put back the APO48, and we send it back out for another trip around the bend to get deliver energy to your body. But see how that Mr. Insulin has a big hand stopping, saying, hey, wait, wait, wait. When, when it cannot get back into the liver, and the person blocking it from the liver, and the person, I really mean the hormone, uh, is insulin. Insulin saying, ah, ah, ah. You, you are not coming back in. I have to use up this glucose before you, I'll let you do this again. And when that LDL circulates in your blood and it's supposed, it's trying to find a place to park, it's looking for a place to park, what happens to it is it gets oxidized. That oxidation of the LDL is again, it's a protective process. Your body's trying to help you. Uh, but in, in, the, in the world of markers to say, if that LDL is oxidized, it's a warning, much like those cytokines, we have danger they've got high insulin, get the insulin down, get the insulin down, and how do you do that? You decrease your carbohydrates. <laughs> All right, so uh, just uh, for a point of clarification, these are the two comparisons. We have now the cholesterol cycling with normal insulin. All right, so these are my keto people, uh, and especially those that, <laughs> I think the people who signed up for the class, uh, the first, this first class, were very advanced people. I was so thankful that some newbies shine, signed up so I could get their feedback on what it's like to be in the first few phases. But if you've been doing the ketogenic diet, and I don't just mean the food, you have chemistry inside your body that has been circulating ketones for the better part of two, four, two three, four months, uh, you hopefully have a much more normal insulin level. But let's just say you never had an abnormal liver. So let's just pretend you're young, healthy, and you cycle into ketosis three to four times a week because you're healthy. All right, let's take a look at them. So first of all, I just want you to point out how beautiful their liver is. There's no bumps and lumps on it. They don't have a fatty liver. Um, it's gorgeous. It's not stuffed full of glycogen bubbles. I mean, it's probably got a few scattered in there. Uh, it's not stuffed full of triglycerides, although it's probably got a few in there. Um, and it's doing its job. So when you eat that high fat food, it takes that fat, those triglycerides, and just like it did in the uh, uh, high insulin state, it puts it in this package called an ApoB48 chylomicron. And inside there is a bunch of triglycerides. And in this case, insulin's at a pretty normal level, so those triglycerides easily flow out to the parts of the body that need them. And who needs a triglyceride? Anybody who's needing energy and anybody who needs to repair the body. Triglycerides are a deliverer of energy and deliverer of, um, of fatty um, uh, lipoproteins that can also really improve the outcome of uh, a broken cell or a broken process or a broken tendon, uh, and your body can repair that. Uh, so again, once uh, several triglycerides get dumped out, it'll go back, rip off the APO48, put on the ApoB100, and now we call it a VLDL. It dishes out some more triglycerides throughout the body. And um, hold on here. As it dish, dishes out um, the, uh, the triglycerides, we then call the density a little intermediate, so that's an IDL. And finally, we get down to LDL. And if, if you hadn't put this together, LDL is that bad cholesterol. We checked the bad cholesterol. My bad cholesterol is high. But what you'll notice here is there's nothing stopping this cholesterol from recycling back into the liver. And why is that? That's because the insulin is normal. And in the, in the setting of those fatty streaks and those risks for heart attacks, we know that the LDL that recycles quickly hops back into the liver, gets filled with triglycerides, and starts to deliver energy to the places that it needs to. And of course, this cycle is a demand-based process. 
So as your body says, we're pretty healthy, we don't need a lot of nutrients right now, um, then the cycling will settle down. Uh, much like cytokines don't drop tomorrow, but they do drop over time. Uh, we see that if you are just starting on the ketogenic diet and you added a whole bunch of fat and six weeks later you go in to check your cholesterol and you say, oh my goodness, my LDL cholesterol is over 200, I'm going to die. I'm like, don't look. <laughs> Way too quick to look. This is still in the process of trying to say we want the flow in and out of your liver to be at, at homeostasis, to be static, to be it reached the demands. And if I see one major process that is hungry when people are, have a high insulin state and they're trying to lower their insulin, first of all, I contend I don't think you can lower insulin in six weeks. It's going to take you six months, nine months to lower your insulin. And that's if you stay the course. That's if you consistently stay ketogenic, not putting in carbohydrates, lowering the, the demand for insulin. And when insulin gets low, the recycling process for your cholesterol can now do what it's supposed to do. Much like the cytokines don't repair overnight, uh, that fatty streak gets less and less volatile when the LDL cholesterol isn't trying to sneak into the wall of your artery. Instead, because your insulin has lowered, the LDL now goes back into your liver and it recycles like it's supposed to. LDL isn't the bad guy. It's just the end of the, it's the, end of the line where everybody else has dumped off its triglycerides and it's trying to get back into the liver. As soon as you remove the high insulin state, it can get back in the liver, and that's the process we want to see happening in healthy people. When I, want, when I study people's cholesterol on a ketogenic diet, and if they insist on checking their cholesterol, I warn them, it's not going to be normal for a year. Uh, I'm not going to make any sense out of this for a year. We can do different tests, and sure, it does help me see which part of the process are you at. Uh, but it is not the, the best clue for your heart attack state by looking at how many LDL are floating around in your blood vessels. So again, a comparison side by side, the one has the liver filled with cholesterol, or excuse me, filled with triglycerides, filled with sugar. It's a high insulin state, so the process of recycling energy throughout the body is not in a good flow state. Um, however, when the insulin is normal, that flow state continues. And although the LDL cholesterol won't be you know, lowering back down to a, a, a homeostasis that we can trust for the first week, it will eventually get there, uh, I would contend, six to nine months into a ketogenic diet. Uh, wow. One little, pro okay, so here we go. So the punchline here is, let's look at the difference between what is um, the insulin state of... Uh, your body, and if it is a highly inflamed insulin state, uh, we want to get it to this much lower, healthier look of an insulin. Um, in that respects, um, I contend it doesn't mean run out and check your insulin. Insulin all by itself doesn't have uh, the best track record for looking at it in a lab. It is a very volatile, changing hormone, and that's what it's supposed to do. It also, even when you give patients these really strict rules to checking their insulin, they're human, things happen. And so if we get one number of insulin and we try to extrapolate what that means, it really is unfair to the patient. The best insulin is one that is measured fasting and then um, you stimulate that body with sugar and you check the insulin four to five times for the next several hours. And we don't just do that once, we do that multiple times. I do not do that in my patients. That is at least $2,500 to check that. And again, I contend that just tells us what the insulin's doing today. Instead, I tell them to measure their glucose and ketone index, just like I did at the beginning of this uh, podcast or this show. Uh, that glucose ketone and using them in combination teaches me, do you have a high insulin state or a low insulin state? And when they do have a high insulin state, when their ratio, their Dr. Boz ratio is above 200, it just says, you're going to get there, but we got to stop putting in so many carbs. We got to drop those carbs to 20 or less. And, um, and that is just the beginning. <laughs> so um, when I look at, uh, let's go here. All right, when I look at how, how long does uh, cholesterol uh, need to go before somebody checks it, um, I really do push people to have a closer look at 
their um, their full picture of uh, of their body, and that is looking at their C-reactive protein, looking at their ferritin levels, um, and and looking at the their particle size, which is again a very expensive test. Many insurances still don't cover it, um, and I would I would do it in a place where you're going to get to see what's the reality. So either before you start the ketogenic diet, you check it, um, or you check it a year later. Um, Instead of doing that, I actually look at, I tell people to order that um, omega-3 quant test. Omega-3 quantitative test is a look at your red blood cells, and it shows in the red blood cell lining, what is your red blood cell made of? Which fats did your body use in this recycling process that we've just talked about that come out of your liver and turn into, uh, you know, chylomicrons, ILDL, VLDL, ILDL, LDL. What, what are the fats that your body is using? And that depends on what you eat. And when you look at um, people eating a ketogenic uh, diet, uh, yes, there's lots of fats. That's the point. There's low amount of carbohydrates. And those carbohydrates create a high insulin state. With that high insulin, uh, the fats can't be used. And unfortunately, that leads to the process that builds up those plaques within an artery. So as you look, this is not a, this is not a cheap subject. <laughs> this uh, topic can get in the weeds pretty easily, uh, and, but it is, it is one that comes up all the time. Uh, when I'm measuring people's risk of a heart attack, uh, it starts with looking at a more global picture that doesn't whimsically change up and down. And I would contend that LDL cl cholesterol, um, it, it does change slowly, but what's happening in the background of their cholesterol or their um, fat metabolism, if you would, is a far higher importance to predicting their health. Uh, that's where I get into looking at Dr. Bob's ratios, looking at uh, omega-3 indexes, looking at other things within their, uh, within their uh, profile that give me a hint where they're at in the progression of uh, switching to a a blocked cycling for fat metabolism versus one that does cycle pretty re pretty easily, and eventually, as the cycling is predictable, uh, then the body says, "You know, we don't need as much as we used to. We're pretty healthy," uh, and that is that's where we want to, especially people who've had a high insulin state. That's where we want to get them. All right, um, all right. Let's go over and see what some of the comments are. So, if you had questions, uh, this is the time to either repost them or. At least, um, yeah, no, you're going to have to repost them. There's, just looking back. As you do that, though, I'm going to have another quick drink. And mm. uh, let's see here. Uh, the other part that I really wanted to make sure to say is a thank you for... Um, all those that uh, we honor on Memorial Day, the, um, the state of Hawaii, but specifically the island of Oahu, has a high military state. And so you can see lots of patriotism this weekend on the beach and um, lots of uh, people uh, really honoring our military as um, hmm. I'm afraid of what happened here. It looks like I froze. <laughs> um, so there's a good question here that I'm going to use, though. Uh, so Jen Lin writes in, can you talk about skinny fat? Having, um, uh, let's see if I can turn that, having major issues with it. Uh, as long as the lace see less than 500 calories of that. Mm, oh, my poor little computer is getting all crabby with me. I just lost that question. Oh, that was a good question. Yeah, somebody says they had a coronary artery calcium score of 970. That's a lot. Uh, we, and unfortunately, it's really difficult to make that go down. So now that you know you've had a history of high LDL or high calcium inside those coronary arteries, um, you want it to not go up. That's, that's one thing to check that coronary artery calcium again. But more importantly, you want to measure other things that are going to accurately reflect what's going on inside that blood vessel lesion. Um, 
So yeah, some other others have pointed out that what, what are some things that you can take? I mean, being keto is step one. Looking at a highly, you know, again, this is not a diet. This is a chemistry set. And it doesn't improve when you just eat a certain way without reaching the chemistry set. So as we watch um, uh, that transition in people's body, it is not a guess whether or not you're in a ketogenic state. Uh, I tell people the first phase for six months when I was on a keto, when I began, we just used urine ketone pea sticks. Those ketone sticks do an awesome job of reflecting where are they at. You know what is the, um, you know what is the um, the. Ooh, I just want to make sure this is interacting. <clears throat> Uh, so I think that's keeping up. I just can't tell if the chat's moving like it's supposed to. Hmm. So I can go over to the other screen and just look at it on the side because it's kind of annoying. Sorry about that, guys. All right, so you'll, your comments are still happening, but uh, to put them on screen just seems to not be working suddenly. So, um, <clears throat> so where was I? <laughs> um, coronary calcium score that was high, and then I went on to, oh, supplements. Uh, number one, yeah, you have to have a chemistry set that actually is the right chemistry. So I know I talk about um, some of my patients I don't have on any supplements. Um, now, they're carefully watched. There's other things we're not worried about. But if I also look at, I mean, my dad had such calcified coronary arteries that a chest x-ray uh, you could see the calcium in his coronary arteries. <laughs> he did not need any other, you know, angiogram or anything, you could see it on chest x-ray. That's a lot of calcium. I don't want to know what the number was. But it tells me that his ability to shuffle calcium correctly was blunted. Uh, so had I put him on a ketogenic diet 15 years ago, I think he could have prevented the, the collapse of his kidney failure. Um, but I also think that I would have put him on K2 D3 vitamin, which is, again, a supplement for somebody who's been a high inflammatory state for too long. Uh, that vitamin D is a huge predictor of lowering heart attacks, lowering dementia, lowering cancer. Um, and so supplementing in a place where the K2 part of that vitamin really helps to, to remove calcium um, or keep calcium in your bones, not putting it in your coronary arteries. And although things that like fermented... Uh, um, kefir or what's the soybean one that's uh, fermented um, I won't think of it right away but or sauerkraut you look at the amount of volume that you need to have of that to get enough of that k2 vitamin and there's just no way in our culture that you can deliver on that when you're when you've had insulin that's been elevated for 50 years so I wish I would have given my dad k2 d3 long before now uh, he's still alive but working uh you know really really suffering so i i i hope i get home to see him before there's a funeral so yeah uh let's uh, go to other questions mm. <laughs> somebody says please list all the tests i should have my cardiologist run uh started keto in january well kathy you know the hard part is is that uh if you've been keto and consistently keto um, what I'd like you to show them is if you haven't ever seen the, the spreadsheet that I, uh, I have, it's called the Neuron Spreadsheet. Um, it's, a, um, it's a free thing that if you scroll down in the, in the show notes, uh, you can get. Uh, and what it is is looking at what are your glucose, what's your ketones, and following that over time. But if you flip to the third tab of that, you'll see a list of quite a few labs that I follow in patients. And when they uh, come to see me, this is one of the things that we look at. Most importantly, though, is we want your risk of a heart attack to go down. So what does that mean? We want your insulin to be lower. We want your hemoglobin A1C to be lower. That's your risk of diabetes. Um, we want to, if I get two tests that I check, if I've never met the patient and they want to know what's my risk of poor health, the two, uh, if I only get two, I check a vitamin D and uric acid. And the reason why is they're really hard to move. Uh, and if they're low, I can know with a high degree of confidence that we have problems. Uh, I mean, that's vitamin D. If the uric acid is high, it's a waste product that should not be building up in the human body. And the higher it gets, the longer their story has been of a highly inflammatory state. Uric acid is something that we measure and follow in gout patients, but it's 
it's way more than that. It is a marker of health. And it, the lower your uric acid, the better I know you're doing. So it's those kinds of things that um, the, the journey of helping your own uh, self by understanding some of these labs is worth it. Um, I would do an omega-3 and take it to you. <laughs> the omega quant 3, uh, see if I have that link readily available. Um, it's something that you order. I mean, it's, I mean, doctors can order it, but it's set up to be done also by, by people from their own, they can do it themselves. Uh, so let's see if I can put that in the thread here. Um, and the reason why it's such a big deal is it tells you what in the last 90 days when you've been eating, how well have you been getting your trans fats down and increasing your omega-3 and omega-6 fats. And those are the ones that keep those red blood cells flexible. Those are the ones that your body really, it says, yes, you're going to have to have fats in, to make up a red blood cell. So what fats are you eating? What fats is your body using? And red blood cells only last 100 days. So it shows you in the last 100 days, how is your body doing at using the nutrients that you are eating? And so I, I think it'd be great to see what your cardiologist says about that because I don't think many of the cardiologists know about it. But it's got huge data to say, this predicts a heart attack. You want to see heart disease? You want to see dementia? You want to see decline? Do not be looking at LDL cholesterol in isolation for sure. But I contend, don't look at it at all. There's so many other parts that you're missing if that's all you're looking at. These are the kinds of things I would look at. Well, um, I am going to call that a wrap. Uh, I, my computer keeps showing me signs of danger, so I'm hoping that it's not glitching on your end. But um, I hope this was helpful. I would like feedback to see if this was on target for answering some questions about your cholesterol, about heart disease, or if you found it not as useful. I think, it, I think the imagery is what I was going for, and to connect it to the fact that when you lower insulin, uh, you get a different processing of your LDL cholesterol, it doesn't end up in the walls of your arteries as much. All right, that's a wrap. Thanks again for everybody tuning in and thanks for several of the questions. I wanna answer one question saying, when, do, when will the class that I just uh, tested out on the first uh, class be open? I'm hoping in the next two to, I mean, in the next month, what are we, uh, June, yes, we were hoping to open it in June. I have a few things I need to tweak because of it, uh, but the, for the most part, we had really good reception of what the class is about. I really want my book to be done <laughs> because that was what I was testing is the content that's in the book. And at this rate, um, yeah, I need to do a lot more time <laughs> spent on finishing up the details of the book. So um, I hope it'll be available in the next few weeks. All right, that's enough questions. We are signing off. I am Dr. Boz, improving your health one ketone at a time. See you next week, everybody.